First, let me just tell you about what we, how we think about the problems that we're facing. So about seven years ago, um, we were looking at the fashion sector, um, five to 8% of global emissions, so a huge source of carbon. Um, and every single fashion company at that point, their climate policies and press releases and commitments applied to their stores and headquarters. That adds up to about 1% of their carbon footprint. Everything else they were leaving off the table. So our first job was like, how do we convince a trillion dollar sector to take responsibility for its full climate impact? Um, we picked Levi's as the first company that we would approach. Um, we really like collaboration. We prefer it. Um, they were really not that interested in collaborating with us. Uh, they were really a very prickly company. Um, we've since become better friends. At the very beginning, though, they wanted nothing to do with us. They wanted to keep it with climate commitments meant stores and headquarters, factories, fossil fuel-based fabrics. Everything else didn't count. Um, so long story short, it took us 18 months. Uh, we convinced them that they had to take the whole picture into account. They became the first company to adopt a full commitment for carbon reduction throughout their entire supply chain. 40% reduction by 2025, which is what we recommended was a real commitment in one of our reports. They adopted it. Now our job was to move the rest of the sector. Since Levi's made their move, we've moved dozens and dozens of companies to make climate commitments that apply to their entire supply chain. Um, now, they have all these huge commitments. We benchmark them annually. And now they need to go from commitment to renewables on the ground. That's our next phase. So we're doing that now, working with brands like H&M, Nike, and Levi's. Um, they've sort of forgiven us for that first campaign to use their brands to move Cambodia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and other countries to move the policy forward that gets them onto renewables sooner, more aggressively than we could ever hope to without those big brands putting their names on the line. That's kind of the story of Stan. Like, how do we start with a small idea that builds and you can see the through line from the beginning to the end so that we can end up moving a trillion dollar sector to move towards a climate safe world? So that's a little bit about us. So Par told you a little bit about that and now we're gonna get into some of the process that we use to achieve those kind of results. Um, and I'm gonna invite Jennifer Egan to come up and talk to us a little bit. Uh, she is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, a friend, and one of our longest time supporters. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, it is wonderful to be here to support an organization I believe in fervently. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that specifically later. Um, but for the moment, before we get into our conversation, I'm going to talk a little teeny bit about this book and read to you from it briefly. Um, so when I was seven, my stepfather's job transferred him from Chicago to San Francisco, and I moved there in the winter of 1969 with my mother, stepfather, and little brother. We stayed in a hotel downtown for the first week, and I have a specific memory of looking out the window of that hotel on our very first morning in this new place and seeing a palm tree and some pastel colors and a blue sky and feeling like I had entered a different world from the rusty Midwestern landscape where I had spent my seven years to that point. I had left behind two sets of grandparents in Rockford and Chicago, and most importantly, my father, whom I immediately began to grow apart from. So there's no question that my life would have been different in ways that I will never know had I stayed in Chicago. And I think of that first morning in San Francisco as my introduction to the essentialness of place, the way in which the location of a story or a life largely determines what that story will be. And I'm pretty sure that my relocation at age seven is one reason that landscape, a physical sensory environment, is my portal into writing fiction. I don't start with a story. I don't even start with characters. I begin with a time and a place 
and my fictional first drafts happen spontaneously and improvisationally from there. The first question is, who is perceiving this environment? That's the beginning of a character. Who else is present? More characters. And finally, what happens? And now we're reading a story. So my fiction is, in some sense, most fundamentally a testament to the connection between human beings and the environment we occupy. And that connection is where fiction starts for me, and it's what moves me to write it in the first place. And it links to the work that we're here to talk about um, by Stand.Earth. So I'm going to read to you briefly from The Candy House, a chapter that draws heavily on that California landscape that I first discovered at age seven. Uh, and I should also mention that landscape is the only point of contact really between my own life and my work. The rest I make up. <laughs> or I think I do. <laughs> Later I discover more, more revelations than I realized. Uh, this, is, this is a chapter from the Candy House called What the Forest Remembers. Once upon a time in a faraway land, there was a forest. It's gone now, burned. And the four men walking in it are gone too, which is what makes it far away. Neither it nor they exist. But in June 1965, the redwoods have a velvety primeval look that brings to mind leprechauns or gin or fairies. Three of the four men have never been in these ancient woods, and to them, the forest looks otherworldly. So removed is it from their everyday vistas of wives and children and offices. The oldest, Lou Klein, is only 31, but all were born in the 1930s and raised without antibiotics, their military service completed before they went to college. Men of their generation got started on adulthood right away. So, four men moving among trees whose musculature resembles the thighs of giants. When the men throw back their heads to search the sunlight for the tree's pointed tips, they grow dizzy. That's partly because they've just smoked marijuana. Not a common practice in 1965, especially among squares, as anyone would agree these four are, or three of them. There is a leader. There is usually a leader when men leave their established perimeters, and today it is Quinn Davies, a tanned, open-faced man accoutred with artifacts of a Native American ancestry he wishes he possessed. <laughs> Normally, Quinn would wear a blazer like the rest of them, but today he's donned what strikes his pals as a costume a purple velvet coat and heavy moccasins that prove far better suited to navigating this soft undergrowth than the Oxfords they're sliding around in. Only Lou manages to keep pace with Quinn, despite the fawn-like skittering this feat requires of him. Lou would rather look spasmodic than risk falling behind. These men all moved to California recently, driven by a lust for space that can't be satisfied by old cities with their tinge of Europe and horse carts and history. There is an ungoverned feel to California's mountains and deserts and reckless coast. Quinn Davies, the only bachelor in the group, is homosexual and was on the lookout early for a graceful exit from Bridgeport, Connecticut, where his family has lived for generations. After the Navy, he followed the Beats to San Francisco. But now that he's here, they've proved maddeningly elusive. Still, there are always sailors who share Quinn's view that a man can be a multitude of ways depending on circumstances. He has a flickering hope about, about one of the other three, Ben Hobart from Minnesota, married to his high school sweetheart, a father of three. But it's too soon to tell. All four work in San Francisco in banking, doing their part to feed an expansion that will draw more restless folk like themselves to the city. Over drinks on Montgomery Street a few weeks back, they got to talking about grass, as marijuana is known, even to those who have never seen it. They know grass is around, but what is it exactly? What does it do? All four like to drink. Quinn Davies drinks so that those around him will drink too. 
which occasionally makes possible an unexpected adventure. Ben Hobart drinks because it subdues a greedy energy that can find no outlet with his wife and kids. Tim Breezley drinks because he's depressed, but that isn't a word he would use. Tim drinks to feel happy. He drinks because after several bourbons, he's overcome by a sensation of soaring lightness, as if he'd finally set down a pair of heavy valises he didn't realize he was carrying. Tim Breezley has a complaining wife and four complaining daughters. Inside his small Clement Street house, he drifts in a tide of shrill feminine discontent that followed him here all the way from Michigan, ranging from aggrieved and exhausted, his wife, to shrieking and infantile, the baby. No matter how much Lou Klein drinks, and he drinks a lot, a part of him is always removed watching with faint detachment as the men around him get plastered. Lou is waiting for something. He thought it was love until he married Christine, whom he worships. Then he thought it was fatherhood, then moving west as they did two years ago. But the sensation of waiting persists, an intimation of some approaching change that has nothing to do with Christine or their kids or the house in Belvedere on a man-made lake where Lou swims a mile each morning and sails a little sunfish. Life is good. It's perfect, really. Yet Lou is haunted by a sense of something just beyond it, something he is missing. Charlene, whom they call Charlie, is six. This morning, she scrutinized Lou, wrinkling her sunburned nose, and asked, where are you going? Short trip north, he said, some fishing, little duck hunting, maybe. You don't have a gun, Charlie said. She watched him evenly, her long, tangled hair raking the light. Lou found himself avoiding her eyes. The others do, he said. His little boy, Rolf, clung to him at the door, pale and dark-haired, Christine's coloring, her iridescent eyes. It's the strangest thing when Lou holds his son, as if their flesh were starting to bind, so that, so that letting go of him feels like tearing. He has a guilty awareness of loving Rolf more than Charlie. Is that wrong? Don't all men that feel that way about their sons, or those lucky enough to have sons? Poor Tim Breezley. There will be no fishing, no hunting. What Quinn divulged that afternoon on Montgomery Street as they drank and smoked their parliaments and roared with laughter before driving their big cars home to their wives and kids was that he knew of some bohemians who grew grass in the middle of a forest near Eureka. They welcomed visitors. We can go overnight on a weekend sometime if you like, Quinn said. They did. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I have to ask you, um, this has nothing to do with climate change or stand at Earth, but your portrayal of men, like where do you, like where do you get that? And I don't really want to hang out with them, but they're so fascinating. Like what is the, what is the inspiration for those characters that, um, especially Goon Squad and Candy House, um, are such a big part of the work? You know, I find character the hardest thing to explain because mm. e even just what I described already of my writing method will tell you that I don't use people I know. In fact, I'm, I'm rather unable to do that when I try. I go a little cold. So the feeling that I have as I'm, as I'm working, and I think the reason I work in the way I do, is a sense of discovery in which I follow what seems interesting about someone and that comes up very spontaneously into the life that contains it. Hmm. And because I really dislike writing about definitely myself, but also people like me. Like I'm not that interested in a middle-aged white lady who lives in Brooklyn. <laughs> I, I, I know that already. Right. <laughs> so I'm always, one of the things I'm always looking for right away especially if there's a danger of, of a person seeming like me, is the ways in which they're different. I kind of mm. lean into those right away. And so in a way, it's a little bit of a shortcut for me to start with a, a male, because I already know this person is different from me. And in fact, it's a struggle in my work to 
keep it 50-50, honestly. Mm. Um, I, I really keep count because my path of least resistance is always male. I mean, you know, <laughs> Dr. Freud might have a few things to say about that. Um, <laughs> But uh, all I can tell you is, for me, f writing fiction is very much about discovery and transcending the, the, the constraints of my life and my psyche and my mm. history. So a male life and history is kind of irresistible, <laughs> given that that's the goal. I love that. Um, so I wanted to actually ask you a question that's very general in a way, but um, in thinking about sort of the connections between, I, I sort of, I sense intuitively that there were things to talk about with the, with the, my relationship to environment and my work and the work that you do. Mm -hmm. But, and that, all of that led me, because in a way starting with place is a little bit unusual. I haven't met a lot mm -hmm. of people who are so um, moved and inspired by place and in fact require it. Um, all the good ideas, it, the ideas that seem good to me are basically inert until I can find a, a location in which they all seem to be um, accessible to mm. me. So, and, and that led me in a way to that moment of looking out the window of the hotel and seeing this, this place that, whose components were just instantly recognizable as being very different from what I knew. And in a way, I think that was kind of a vocational moment for me. Mm. Uh, and I wonder if you have a similar story or a, a moment of, of, of your discovery of your vocation. Uh, yeah, but, <clears throat> yes, but very differently in a, in a, in a way. Um, sameness is actually what was the sort of trigger for me. So um, I, we grew up uh, in upstate New York um, and my, <laughs> my father has, had the distinction of not dropping out of school, but being kicked out of school. Uh, high school, he was a pool shark, vacuum cleaner salesman, did all these crazy things, and eventually straightened out and started in New York State Electric and Gas as a meter reader, um, going to people's basements, reading their meters. Um, and he retired with 5,000 people reporting to him. So every two years, we moved. Uh, three years, as he got promoted up through the ranks. And so for me, um, I was an athlete, and so that each time we moved, I had a sort of a built-in group of friends through my athletics, but also through the forest. Um, and so that was the, every place we went, that was the same. And so that was like my grounding thing was to be at home there. And so no coincidence that then, you know, flash forward, it's been 30 years of working on those places. Wow, that's such a great story. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I think we've talked about just casually, it's something that I think about a lot as I've raised my kids and found that every trip to every zoo, any sort of educational interaction with the natural world has involved a stern warning that it is disappearing mm. and that it's up to them <clears throat> to save it. And I, I'm, I've been delivering this warning as much as anyone else, I'm sure. But in retrospect, I have to say, I think that's been a very mm. pressureful and, and, a, and a kind of heavy existential burden to place on them. Mm. Um, and it's been interesting to see how they've reacted to it. Like one of my kids became just sort of uh, frozen with terror. Like, how, what's the point of being alive if the world is ending? Which is the message he felt mm. like he was getting. And then the other took a different approach, was like, I don't care. Like, that was his coping mechanism. So, and I, I'm struck by the fact that I didn't have those messages coming to me as a child interacting with the natural world. Yeah. And you, it sounds like you really had a lot of interaction with the natural world. And I wonder if you had a sense of it as imperiled or endangered. Um, well, I mean, it's another, that's, that's another story. Let's so hear my, it. My, the, first, the first activist um, act that I did, I have, I have yet to be arrested. Um, sorry, Zipporah, who's been arrested many, many times. Um, actually, one of the things that, that sparked me to activism was sort of a funny story. Um, in upstate New York, I worked at a marina as a kid, um, and somebody from the city, which was like a whole foreign location in the world to us, Somebody, somebody from the city, and we actually don't even know what the real story was, but the allegation was that he killed a goose, right? And these, these geese were like these beautiful, majestic uh, animals. 
And we took it upon ourselves to uh, get retribution for this, this murder of this goose, that, which, I mean, it may be that the goose just died and happened to be on his property. We don't even know. Um, but we actually swam, and Rambo was really big at this time, so this will explain oh part of the story. So we swam across the bay, um, swear to God, naked with knives in our teeth, <laughs> and sank his boat, and swam back, and the police came the next day. We never got caught. That was my first like, truly like, vengeful act on behalf of the environment. And I'm sure to this day he has no idea that the swan was connected to the boat. So we hopefully have gotten better at this. The messaging um, part the was me kind of missing. Messaging. We didn't have a comms team at that point. Um, but that, you know, that was like my first like, really active moment of feeling like I need to put myself in a place of making some difference, clumsy though it was. Um, but I, I have a question for you on your process. So we at Stand Out Earth, we are staring at climate change all the time. Um, and it can be exhausting. And there's a lot of uh, post-apocalyptic or dystopian fiction out there these days, um, which I indulge in occasionally. Um, but one of the things I was interested, because I've known you for so long, I know how much you care about climate change, these issues, you fund it, you support us, you support other groups. Um, and the way it often or sometimes appears in your work is almost like sidelong, like the water wall is one of the scenes I'm thinking of in Visit from the Goon Squad, where for me, it's even more powerful that it's not obviously the centerpiece of what's happening. But like, wh why do you do it that way? And I'm wondering if there's anything our movement can learn, um, which is sometimes a bit doom and gloomy, um, from the way you approach these types of things and communicate about them. Well, I don't know about the latter question because mm. the projects are so different. I mean, yeah. I think one thing is I personally do not like didactic fiction. Mm. Um, I'm not interested in being taught a lesson. I, I want to read for pleasure. And I'm happy, and in fact, I welcome a kind of intellectual rigor, a strong girding of ideas. I love complexity, but I don't like moralizing. I really turn off. For mm. me, it's actually antithetical to um, fiction that feels, that holds on to the, the, the thing that's most important of all, I would say, which is the mystery that is at the heart of mm. everything. Um, so, and, and I understand why, dy so as a, as a genre, dystopia has a lot to offer. Genres always exist because they, they are fun for various reasons or they serve the writer well and the reader. Dystopia is great because there's an inherent dramatic backstory. We always, there's always the question, how did we get here? And the stakes are extremely high. Usually it's an inhospitable environment. You know, uh, what's going to happen to the protagonist? So there are lots of reasons that people like to read and write dystopia. I personally don't. I can't quite explain it. I just turn off from mm. it and, and I'm not that interested in it. So the tools that I tend to bring are more um, curiosity uh, and, and and actually, you know, when it comes to things like technology, I'm much more worried as a person than you would probably know from my fiction. Because again, I think that those worries are, uh, it, it, this is why I like to transcend my own life. I mean, who wants to sit around worrying all the time? But one thing that's striking is that I, I sometimes feel like I learn from my work what I actually think. So for example, with The mm. Candy House, I felt a lot of anxiety. It was, I finished it during the pandemic. You know, the, the, the presence of Trump in the White House was a source of enormous anxiety for me and many. Um, I felt like the world was sort of going to hell in the way that it's very common to say that it is. Mm. And I think that a lot of us feel that it is, although I sometimes wonder how much technology has to do with that, which is a separate point. Um, but I, I felt like this book would probably reveal the depth of my worries. But in fact, I think that what, what it, the, the story it actually tells is about is a, um, a tremendous amount of faith in human beings and what they're capable of. Mm. Um, so I, I guess it, that was a, one, a heartening thing to discover, that mm. in fact, I have a huge amount of faith 
in human beings. I think we can solve most problems. Um, unfortunately, we, we do tend to wait until our backs are to the wall. <laughs> and in the case of the climate crisis, that is not an appropriate um, response time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I guess in my nature, I feel a lot of optimism, more than I even know I feel in a day-to-day -day way. Mm. And for me, uh, fiction is is more alive if it's an if, if it's an environment of discovery and curiosity than it, than if it is an environment of of dispensing wisdom and lessons. I think the NGO movement could learn something from that. <laughs> well, it's tricky though because what I mean, I I really feel for someone doing what yeah. you do because you're steeped in data and studies that are terrifying. Mm. I mean, one thing I try to do is control the amount of information I take in about the climate crisis. Like, there will be the moment, a moment where, I mean, for a long time I thought, why is this not in the mainstream media more? Now, I, I don't have that complaint, but I see stories and I think, okay, is this the right moment to read this? And I, I weigh it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know what? If I'm feeling a little shaky, <laughs> if the day is just getting started, if I feel like it's going to really plunge me into a morose state, I won't do it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading uh, an article a while ago by, by a coral specialist, um, a diver, who talked about how he was going to visit these various sites of, of coral um, that had once been very much alive and now was imperiled and sometimes dead. And he mentioned that he always saves for his last visit this one place, I can't remember where it is, where the coral is still really robust, and I hope it's still true, because mm. this was a couple of years ago. But you know, he was, he was adjusting his own psych psychology, his own psychological experience so that he could emerge energized. I mean, mm. the problem is, if you're not energized, then nothing gets done. And we have to act. Yeah. So it's a very, I, I think it's a very tricky situation that you're in. You have mm. to know every, all of this stuff and yet be energized and act. And so my question for you is, mm. how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, Stand Out Earth is a little bit different. Like we, we approach these issues um, with a sense of hope and a sense, a sense of possibility. And like, so we're attracting we have a million plus people that are part of the stand community on all the various in-person and electronic platforms. And so we're cultivating a group of people that believe in possibility, that believe that no matter how dire things are, we can make huge things happen, like tilting entire global sectors of the economy, right? So that, that's part of our DNA. Um, and so that's like the sort of meta answer. I think the, the, the personal answer is, goes back to the first story, which is forests. So for me, it's a certain amount of working hard, um, working with our teams, pushing and taking in the knowledge without getting too depressed by it, applying it, but then also taking a break and getting into either mountains, forests, or ocean. And that's where I get my creativity to keep coming back and try to do this over and over again to, to change what's, what's happening on this planet. Um, and without that, you know, my, not my fuel tank, but my battery runs low. Um, but <laughs> we I'm, have to change our metaphors. Yes, exactly. I'm wondering though from your, so we have to bring creative problem solving to these big gnarly global issues and it's a part of our work. You're seemingly, your whole job is creativity in a certain way. Like, how do you, in the midst of all of this, how do you stay fresh and creative? And what do you bring to your work to keep that happening? Well, I think some of it is just being engaged with the world around me. I mean, I'm a very curious, kind of nosy person. Um, and, and so I, I'm, no, I'm always interested in everything. And I feel like being a fiction writer kind of gives me license to call that my job. Um, I'm also a journalist, so I even have um, further <laughs> Uh, legitimacy as a nosy person. Um, so I think that's part of it. I, I, I guess one thing is I try to notice um, moments where I'm having a thought or an idea that feels alive in a certain way that I've come to n notice. Um, someone recently called it a spidey sense, which is kind of silly, but actually th mm. there's something to that. It's this sort of prickling feeling that something is going to lead somewhere. And I keep an unbelievable number of lists of these moments, <clears throat> thoughts, ideas. I'll listen to, to music and think, 
something about the structure of it is interesting and maybe I can use it. And I don't even really, I don't know a thing about music really, so I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'll just say uh, structure of X, whatever it is. So I'm, I'm try, I try to pay attention to what goes through my head because mm -hmm. in a way that's what I have to work with. Um, and then I also, I notice moments that feel really generative. So for example, for a long period, it was the shower. That was environmentally not so good. Um, because I grew up in California, in San Francisco, during the, the you know a gigantic drought where we were firmly told you can't. And in fact, it, the ultimate luxury to my mind was to let the water run while you're soaping. Like, no, no one does that. I, it still feels like a gift to be able to do that, which really shows you how when you learn something as a kid, it's with you forever. But um, so I had, I had a period where a lot of connections happened in the shower and I definitely wasted water. Luckily, lately, I find that it's the period between being asleep and being awake that's really important for me. Um, I think more and more about dreams, which are always boring to hear, but the phenomenon of, in fact, there's a married couple in the candy house and in their vows was, don't we won't make each other listen to our dreams. So <laughs> it's not that I want to foist my dreams on anyone, but I'm, I am more and more in awe of what dreaming is because it really is art production. You know, we take the stuff of our lives and we create sometimes amazing symbolic texts mm -hmm. that are very rich. So. I, when I first wake up, I sometimes will think, okay, now I'm gonna address X, Y, or Z, sometimes all three in succession, and I'm, I'm able to find solutions really quickly in that time. So I think identifying the time or place or situation in which our brains are working best is really important. Mm. I'm curious, um, I know we're about to open this to audience questions, but I would love to hear just a little more about how it works for you mentally when you're mm. in one of these places. Like, yeah. you know, how, 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 how is it for you? What is that experience of solving problems or feeling creative in those environments? Um, so for me, um, one of the things that, that I've developed, you know, as you get older, you start to not just run into things that work, but you start to develop a practice around them. Um, and so one of the things that I do when we're trying to solve, uh, you know, like how do we get to this company? How do we break through to this government to get them to change? How do we come up with financing for solar in Vietnam, like all these different things that require a certain amount of work and creativity. Um, I got really got, about 15 years ago, got really into meditation. Um, and I got into it through athletics. I had a, a meditation coach that was working with me um, that when I'm skiing in the backcountry or I'm mountain biking, that moment where you have nothing in your mind but the present, um, this coach told me, well, that's what meditation is. So when you're, the reason you do this all the time for mountain biking and skiing is to get that moment of freedom and your brain, even though you're focused on staying alive um, and in that moment, um, your brain kind of relaxes. And so it's actually after that, after meditating or skiing or biking, that all of a sudden a breakthrough will come. And so that I've developed that more and more into like, I can't solve this. I need to go for a bike ride, or I need to go ski, um, and be in mortal danger, and then I'll relax, and then I'll come up with a solution. <laughs> and does it does the solution float into your mind soon thereafter? Sometimes it takes like a full day or a sleep or something, so it might link into what you're tapping into with your dream mm. dream state. But it sometimes takes a little while, um, but it always comes from a pause of some sort. Mm. Yeah. And so we're going to open it up to audience questions for me or for Jenny. So if you want to ask either of us about anything we've talked about or something we haven't talked about, now is your chance. Uh, thank you so much for the work. And Jenny, thank you for your work. Um, I have a question for you. What other projects? You talked about the, the clothing. I'm just curious, maybe one or two others that are, um, that are in the works or uh, that you're you know, that you're looking at into right now. Yeah. Um, so the question was, what else are we doing? Like, what are the big projects that we're, we're excited about at this moment? Um, one is uh, we have a network of elected and staff that work in cities all across the U.S. and now we're expanding into Canada. We've scoped out Europe as well. So working with city leaders 
Um, it turns out that cities don't have the money to do sophisticated legal analysis to move gas out of their jurisdictions or move solar in. There's actually a m bunch of need. We actually approached this, this idea of working with cities with, with the thought that we were going to have to, like a company, campaign against them and force them to change. Um, and 80% of our effort would be there and 20% on solutions. And it's been reversed entirely. They, they want to move forward. They don't have all the money the industry has to do all the legal analysis to make sure if they enact a gas ban, a gas station ban, all of which we're doing with cities all across North America, that it will stand a legal challenge. And so that's one of the campaigns we're really excited about. Um, we have also uh, been working for many years on oil and gas infrastructure projects. So we, as Zipporah mentioned, like we have to stop expanding oil and gas. Um, and so part of that means beating them when they propose something new. And so over the last maybe seven years, we have beaten over 20 pipelines, oil by rail terminals, refinery expansions, um, all across North America. And so there's more, those are the kind of things that we're really engaged in at this moment. Um, and we have some new stuff coming up this year that I'm really excited about, um, including taking on one of the largest companies in the world in the food and agricultural sector. So um, more stuff coming. One other, just follow up quickly. Yeah. I know the PER groups, like I was in Pennsylvania, Penn PER, they do similar kind of work in, in working with companies to go forward. Do you ever partner with other groups? Or? We always partner. Um, in, fa in fact, we have huge networks of organizations um, at this point all around the world that we work with. Um, and our orientation, though, is from the ground up. So we are, you know, every organization has a different sort of orientation. Our orientation is to frontline groups, indigenous leadership, um, First Nations. Like, what are they seeing and fighting? And can we bring new tools and new partnership to them? Because climate is global, but it always comes down to a people and a place. And that's our, our specific orientation. Um, a question for both of you. So I heard this question years ago and I loved it, so I often throw it out there. You know, every project, whether you're an artist or an activist, you know, there's the launch, there's the doing, there's the finishing. What's your favorite part of the arc? <laughs> Starting, doing, ending, and why? That's a great question. <laughs> I can see why you're, you're holding on to that one. Um, I think for me, it's the revision part so the, the, generation, the generation of the new material is very, it can be very exciting, but it, it's sort of blind and chaotic because of the way I work. But once I have all of that, and I've typed it, read it, gone through the stages of grieving over what I've found there, um, <laughs> and made an outline, which is when outlines come into the picture for me, about how I'm gonna make it better, which means that I have some sort of vision, finally, of what I'm trying to do, then that sense that I'm making it better is really thrilling. And I find that I can do it anywhere, anyhow, because I, I write fiction by hand. I should have mentioned that, actually. Uh, and I also tend to edit by hand on hard copies. So I find that part so exciting that I've done it on escalators, in elevators. I've gotten off the subway and sat in a subway station in New York, not, your fa not the best place to be, just because I, was, I just wanted to finish what I was doing before I hit the street. So it's that problem solving that's really fun. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I guess, I mean, so if you were to try to create an organization with a perfect brand, um, it would not look like Stand. So we do a lot of different things. Some people can't see the connections. I see the connections. They all relate. Um, so I think starting is the thing that gets me really excited. A new, especially a new idea to an old problem. Mm. Um, a creative solution where um, I especially like if a whole bunch of groups have worked on something and not made progress. Um, and we have a different angle on it. So it's that, that sort of like new approach to maybe break through where others have not quite broken through. So starting. A uh, question for either one of you. Uh, where do you see the role of spirituality in the uh, movement of uh, 
uh, climate change. Hmm. Great question. So where do, where do we see the role of spirituality in, in climate change and also just in what we do? I'm, I would, I'm not a very religious person. I was raised Catholic. Um, the, but the exper I think one reason I love to write fiction is that the experience of doing so feels pretty transcendent, it, it, almost definitionally, in that I am actually being lifted out of the circumstances of my world into something that feels higher because it's more. Um, and so I, I realized over time that I think there is a kind of spiritual aspect to this. I have a more psychological lens, so I think in terms of the unconscious, but there's no question that the feeling of tapping into something that is beyond what I consciously know is exhilarating and for what I do, totally necessary because I'm not, I'm not someone who starts out with a plan. If I made a plan, it wouldn't be good enough. It would be too close to a plan someone else might think of. Um, so I, would, I guess my answer is the whole thing feels pretty infused with a kind of excitement that, that is a bit otherworldly, and, and you could certainly call it spiritual. Um, the broader movement, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I can talk, talk to you about Stan, though. Um, so spirituality at stand if you've ever tried to get a group of activists to do anything it's not easy um, but i mentioned earlier meditation my own practice we actually have a meditation practice at stand um, so for every staff call every in-person meeting the beginning of any meeting of any length uh, there is time to breathe together and so for it's not overt uh, as a spiritual practice um, but i think many of us get a sense of breathing together that we're in something much bigger than ourselves. Question in the back. Um, hi, I've been working in climate change, carbon accounting for 10 years, and I've always uh, been frustrated by the potential that I see for civic engagement to pressure companies or to compel governments to behave or to regulate on their behalf. And I'm just wondering if you have any insights into communicating to compel communities to change or to act in their interest. I'm not sure if this is a, you could talk about it from the perspective of storytelling to engage communities. Hmm. Sounds like a me question. Yeah, I think it is, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we actually um, are beginning an experiment along those lines um, at this point, because I, I think too often what has happened oh. is um, groups doing our kind of work say to communities, like, come and do the work we're doing. And many of those communities are looking at us and saying, well, come and do the work we're doing. Um, and so we have just begun an initiative to, um, to train people in the sort of like the art and science of organizing um, on their home issues. And the idea is that we're going to be able over time to build up not only make them better at moving their own home, you know, small companies, governments in their hometowns, um, but that they will begin to join some of our efforts on global issues and global companies. And I think that that give and take is what has been missing. Um, there's been more of like, you do my stuff or, you know, and the same thing from the other direction. And I think we have to see that what's happening at the local level um, is so important and it's going to add up to the bigger change that groups like Stand are trying to do and we have to do it together. So that can only move, as, as my organizers are, are fond of telling me, it can only move at the speed of trust. And we are, at least for Stand, we are beginning to say, like we will bring capacity, skills, training, um, and not expect you to only do our work. And that's the only way forward. For Todd, what is the missing link between the conservation of the natural world and capitalistic progress? That's all of the time myself, so it didn't. Wow. Um, there's a yeah, there's a huge missing link. Um, uh, I mean, so we, at, at, you know, at Stand Out Earth, we are trying to reform capitalist systems, right? 
there's a much bigger question, which which I'm not going to answer now. Maybe maybe Jenny has an answer to this. Is is what's what? So if if capitalism isn't working, then what is the thing that would work? And that's like so we're trying to stop the bleeding and limit the damage and get to something more sustainable and a planet that doesn't completely blow up and overheat. Um, and that's going to be my lifetime. Um, I think it's the next question is like, if not capitalism, what? And that's something that um, people with more time on their hands um, and bigger budgets need to grapple with. Um, but it's it's a great question, and we have to be we have to be grappling with it. Yeah. I mean, all I would say is I'm I'm terrible at trying to imagine the future. But if I write into the future, I find that I have a lot of ideas that I discover as they, as they appear on the page. Mm -hmm. So the only way I could answer that question is to try to get there in fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm curious to see what might come along. I, I, but my mind goes blank as a, as a citizen trying to answer it. I can only do it um, through curiosity and, and, uh, and experimentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yes. Um, how did you, this is for Todd, uh, after the Resolute lawsuit, mm. um, which to me was sort of the beginning of this whole <laughs> an endless stream of such things, not mm. with Stand as the target, but how did you manage not to sort of be cowed by that and continue to be as sort of creative and out there and <laughs> not let it stop you in your tracks? Yes, yes. Well, uh, so the question relates, we are sued for actually it was $300 million uh, by Resolute uh, Forest Products, the largest logging company in Canada for a campaign we were running against them and their industry. Um, and so they sued us in federal court. Uh, the question is how did we, uh, basically survive that and remain creative uh, through that process. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, it was partly through goal setting. So like when we do corporate campaigns, we often think, what is the thing that um, the company really doesn't want to have happen? Right. So then can we bring that to them as a way, if they're refusing to collaborate with us, what's the thing that we could, like, can we start to make their brand less valuable? Can we make their employees rebel against the company. Can we, like, what are the things, so what I thought about is when we got sued is, like, what's their worst, the worst possible outcome for Resolute? They're going to spend millions and millions of dollars suing us and suing me personally as well as Stan, which was especially fun. Um, and I didn't have 300 million in the bank. Uh, so what I thought about immediately was, well, if we grow our organization, grow our budget, have new people join our board, new people join our staff, and get bigger and stronger, like how disappointing would that be for Resolute? And so I was like, that's what we're doing. And so that's what we actually did. Um, and it was super, I mean, there's nobody from Resolute here, I would assume. It was actually super scary. Um, but publicly, uh, we were going to do all those things and not stop campaigning um, and fight them tooth and nail and be bigger and stronger at the end of it. Um, and it was actually those goals and a lot of support from people like Leslie who asked the question and Jenny and many other people along the way that kept us going. Um, but there was no way they were going to win. Check. <laughs> so that's, that's the end of the formal questions. Um, we're going to stay around. Um, the bar will be open. The galleries will be open. Um, and we are also inviting folks to, if you're moved by what you heard tonight, to support us. Um, and we have one of our longest time supporters ever uh, here to talk to you about that a little bit. So I have had the good fortune for the past 22 years to serve on the board of a small foundation called the Mental Insight Foundation. And its focus has mostly been mental health issues um, and strategies. Uh, but 
the category actually broadened over the years to address certain forces that were interacting with mental health and climate, the climate crisis was certainly one of those. So it was in my role as a board member and a funder uh, that I first encountered Stand um, many, many years ago. It had to have been 20 at least. I think so. Um, and of the many, many organizations that this foundation, which is actually actually sunsetting now, um, of the many organizations that we have supported, STAND is the one that I have found the most meaning in being involved with. Um, you've heard about some of, of the STAND's many concrete achievements, which are pretty awe-inspiring. Um, but I will say from the perspective of a grant maker, um, that it is it, the nimbleness, the continuity, the organizational strength, and the tremendous effectiveness of STAND over the years that has made it a really standout organization to support. My youngest son committed all of his bar mitzvah money to STAND. Um, I think he feels good about that. Um, <laughs> Um, I support it personally, it, it, independent of the Mental Insight Foundation. Um, and for me, Stand is that rare organization that I trust so deeply that it has earned my blanket support. And I'm pretty picky. I've been the president of the board of a not-for-profit. And I, I look very carefully at, at the um, institutions that I support. So I'm going to turn things over to Todd um, with my deep wish that all of you will engage with this organization because it has really earned that support. Thank you. And so last word on this is that um, we mentioned we're very data driven. If you're moved to give to stand, you are 7 million times more likely to actually do it if you do it while you're here. So there are like iPads, 7 million times more likely. Um, there are iPads, <laughs> there are envelopes, um, there's lots of ways to support us. We really uh, would love if you did that, and especially also if you stay with us. And finally, a big thank you to Jenny Egan for being with us today and supporting us for so many years.